I remember that one of the things that really fascinated me at school, and even now when our daughters had the opportunity to do it, is and maybe you will remember what, what, what it is. It's when you get an A4 page from your teacher, and they fold it in half, and then you open it up, and then they say, and the one half, I want you to paint something. And so you paint. And then they say, now close it, and rub it nicely, and then open up. And then usually what happens is when you open up, it's like, wow, I can't believe I painted on both sides. Did I really do that? And what you have is you have this beautiful symmetrical picture that you've created. And usually it's when we went to do butterflies and you have to draw the thingies and pen and so on. And I think in a way what we are going to do this morning is we're going to try and explore, as we've come to this table this morning, a beautiful sense of symmetry between Sabbath and communion. Now we find the Sabbath commandment mentioned in the Bible twice. We find it mentioned in Exodus for the first time, and then we find it mentioned in Deuteronomy, which was read to us by Audrey this morning. Thank you, Audrey. And so what I want us to do this morning is I want us to explore these two times that it's given to us. Now, first of all, the Sabbath is given to us before the fall of humanity, before sin enters into the world. It's briefly shared with us, and we, we can learn a lot from that beautiful picture about when the Sabbath is given to us. But then the next time the Sabbath is addressed is when Moses receives the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, and we find the Sabbath commandment pressed in there as the fourth commandment. So take your Bibles and open them up to Exodus chapter 20, and let's read this fourth commandment. We also have it on the screen for you. It might be a little bit small this morning for those at the back, as uh, we try to press a lot of words into one screen. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, we pick up the fourth commandment. We're not going to read all of them. We're just going to focus on the fourth commandment. It says the following in verse 8. From verse 8 onwards, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For why? Why shall you not do this? Because in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So we see here that the Sabbath is given here in the Ten Commandments with a particular rationale. There's a particular reason for it. And the Sabbath is being connected here with something that happened, something that verse 11 tells us the reason for the Sabbath. And so it says there in verse 11, remember the Sabbath day, why? Because in six days the Lord has made the heavens and all the earth. So we see that the Sabbath, here in the fourth commandment, is connected to creation. Simple? You with me? It's connected with creation. In other words, it's a remembrance of the finished work of God's creation. We always sometimes refer to it as a memorial of the finished work of whose work? God's work. So the Sabbath is a memorial of the finished work of God's creation. That's it. That's the fourth commandment in Exodus chapter 20. The Sabbath is a memorial of the finished work of God's creation. Now, as I said, this is not the first time that we get the Sabbath. This is not the first time. This is not the only time, I mean, that we get the Ten Commandments and we get the fourth commandment given to us. Again, it's given to us Later on, first of all, Moses goes up to Mount Sinai. He gets the Ten Commandments written on these tablets of stone. He comes down. As he comes down the mountain, he gets to the bottom. He sees that the Israelites have built this golden calf that they are now worshiping during his absence. And out of, out of rage for the fact that in his absence, they, they'd already forgotten the God that had delivered them from Egypt. In his rage, he throws those tablets down. They, they shatter into pieces and we find that the tablets or the commandments are then given to him a second time, and they are recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 5. So let's go back to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 5 now, uh, the second set of commandments. If you have your Bible, go there in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And we find that here in Deuteronomy chapter 5, that when the commandments are recorded for a second time, we will notice that, the, that all the commandments are exactly the same, virtually exactly the same, all ten commandments except for the fourth commandment. There's a change. There's something different. All the commandments are the same, the same as in Exodus. 
And yet here, yeah, the fourth commandment slightly changed. And so when we read it, we will notice that there's a difference in this second account from the first account. So let's see if you can pick it up. Let's begin again in verse 12. It says, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm, therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Did you see it? So notice here that the Sabbath is connected with a different event. In Exodus, the whole rationale for the Sabbath is creation, God's finished work of creation. And so God says to us, why should you keep the Sabbath? Well, in Exodus, he says to us, because I have finished my creation work. It's a memorial of that work that I have done, the work of creation. But we notice here in Deuteronomy that the rationale for the Sabbath is slightly different. So notice the differences here. The difference is in verse 11 in Exodus chapter 20, if we can put it on the screen, and in, in chapter 15 of Deuteronomy chapter 5. Oh, verse 15 of Deuteronomy chapter 5. So in the one, the Sabbath is given, why? Because in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. The Sabbath is given in Deuteronomy chapter five, why? Because remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt, and I, through my outstretched arm and hand, have delivered you from slavery. So the second time, the second time around that the Sabbath is given, is that it's connected to what? Did you pick it up? It's connected to what? It's connected to the deliverance of, of, from bondage from the land of Egypt. And so we see that along with keeping the Sabbath as more memorial of creation, now the Sabbath also becomes a memorial of the deliverance from slavery. So we see that the Sabbath becomes this this beautiful, beautiful symmetrical point, almost that line like you have within an A4 paper, that line between creation and redemption. It's a memorial of creation, but it's also a memorial, a symmetrical memorial, memorial of redemption. In other words, God is not contradicting himself here. He's not saying you're in Exodus, it's here like this in Exodus, and then he says in Deuteronomy, oh, but in Deuteronomy it's here. No, 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 he, he, he's, he's complementing the two with each other. There's a sense of continuity. There's a sense in which God is saying there's harmony here between creation and between redemption. It's the same power, the same power that's born out of, out of a God who is love that is present at creation is the same power that is present when he, when he takes them out of slavery. That's a good amen, that. It's the same power. It's the same power that we spoke about weeks ago, this other-centered benevolence power of God. It's the same power, it's the same function within this triune circuit of beneficence that we looked at last time that was at creation that is also now present at redemption, at deliverance from bondage of slavery. Exactly the same thing happens. Same thing happens at creation that happens at redemption. The same thing. And so in one account, God's power is leveraged for the purpose to create. In the other account, God's power is leveraged for the purpose to redeem you and me. To redeem our children, to redeem our family, to redeem our friends. And so in the one case, it's the power of love, if we can use that term. And in the other case, it's the power of love. God's doing it as well. This is what I love about these passages. It reminds us, the commandments remind us that it's God that's doing it. God is the one that creates. God's the one that finishes his work. And God is the one that delivers from the slavery of sin. It's God that does this. And the beautiful thing about coming here together on a Sabbath, if you can just imagine, if you can just sense the, the heaviness of that beauty, is that it's God that's doing it. God's the one that draws us closer to him. 
And God's the one that when we recognize our position, our proper position in relationship with God, we recognize that it's a position of dependence. It's a position of rest. We have to rest in dependence on God. And so when we think of the Sabbath in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 5, it references the Israelites' deliverance from Egypt. That's the reference. And, and I don't know about you, but when it references the Israelites' delivery from Egypt, it kind of makes me go back to one specific narrative, one specific story within that deliverance. And once you see it, you cannot not see it. It's the story of? Of the plagues. It's the story of the ten plagues, particularly the tenth plague. And so now when you see, wait a minute, it, yes, I, I can see it. Maybe you can't. Well, let's see if I can make you see it. <laughs> all right? You, you remember the story of the plagues? We don't have time to go through the, all the stories. But here you have God coming there to uh, Pharaoh, and he's, the Israelites are in bondage. They're in slavery there by the, the Egyptians. And God says to Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no way. And so God starts sending these plagues, one after the other, and as, as these plagues go across the whole of, of Egypt, Pharaoh's heart gets harder and harder and harder. He becomes more stubborn and more stubborn and more stubborn. And by the ninth time, none of these plagues were able to deliver the Israelites from slavery to the point that it gets to the tenth plague. This tenth disaster that befalls upon them and at the 10th time, you know the story, God instructs the Israelites through Moses. He says to them, you've got to take what? You've got to take a, a lamb, without, a lamb that is blameless, a lamb that is spotless. You have to take this lamb, this firstborn lamb, and you have to kill this lamb. And you have to take this lamb's blood, and you have to put the blood over the doorposts that, that in totality signifies the covering of the household by the blood of the lamb. Can you start seeing the significance now? So that... So that when the angel passes over, which is where, where this whole concept of Passover comes from, a remembrance, decades later they would remember that, that the, the angel of death passed over their houses because they were covered by the blood of the Lamb. But it was not just, it was not just something, a symbol for them to look back at, it was also a symbol for them to look forward to when the real Lamb of God will be the one who dies on the cross and who will shed his blood for you and me. And so there's a sense in which when we, when we recognize in the Sabbath commandment here that it refers to this beautiful act of, of God dying on the cross for us, can you think about something more, more beautiful that we can do is to come together here this morning on the Sabbath and come to reflect and remember God's act, his sacrifice. But it was not just an act. It was not just a sacrifice. That lamb wasn't just sacrificed and the blood just put on that doorpost for the sake of artistry. That lamb was sacrificed. The blood was put on that doorpost so that the sin of that family would be covered. So that their sin would be non-existent. And when Jesus dies on the cross, he dies to make our sins non-existent. So we've come here this morning with the opportunity to come face to face with the one who died on the cross for us on the Sabbath. Within this beautiful symmetry to remember that he's standing here with open arms this morning. He's the one that's drawing us in. He's the one that's drawing you in. And he's standing here with open arms, not arms, not, judge, not judgmental arms, but, but loving arms welcoming arms to say, come, come to me, come participate in this, in this remembrance service, take that cup, take that bread, and remember that it was me who sacrificed my body on the cross, it's me who poured out my blood on the cross, so that my, by my blood that you are, are proclaimed clean. But come, don't just come and participate, come and lay, lay those sins at his feet. Acknowledge them. Affirm that those are your sins. Because it's when we acknowledge them to Christ and affirm them and speak them out to him 
You don't have to shout them out. You can just say it in your mind, you know. You can hear that. But when we do that, there's a sense in which we hand them over. We acknowledge the struggles. We acknowledge the challenges that our sins bring upon us. You know, when we engage in any particular sin, it weakens our willpower. And so the next time, it's more difficult for us to resist it. And so, that, so when we yield, with, we yield to one temptation, the next time it's easier to yield to that, to them, that temptation. And our moral nature becomes weaker and weaker, and we can become more bound and more bound to the slavery of that sin. And before you know it, we are slaves to that sin. We are addicted to that. That's just a, a modern word for slavery, by the way. To the point where we are almost impotent to it and completely enslaved by it. And so it's on a day like today, it's, it's at a moment like this when we can come to this table and God is reaching out to us. He's reaching out to you and me this morning with open arms on this beautiful Sabbath, with a tender embrace, inviting you and me to pour out our sin at his feet and let him, let him give us strength to overcome those sins. Let me just say this. Most of us sitting here this morning are addicted to some sin. We are. We don't have to continue to be addicted to those sins. We can hand ourselves and our struggle over, and God can, can step in as He desires to, and He can help us to start break, breaking that cycle. And so the Sabbath, not just communion, which we do once a quarter, but the Sabbath then becomes that continual check-in. It's almost like going to the doctor. This continual check-in. A continual reminder, a time where we are reminded that He has already overcome on our behalf. And we just need to come and draw from Him again. That He's already overcome all temptation and that He is uniquely positioned to be able to overcome your temptation and my temptation. So I want to invite you this morning. There is no obstacles to coming to this table. Everybody is welcome. You don't have to be of a particular religious persuasion. You just have to believe that what will happen this morning is that you and God will encounter each other. I want to invite you to come this morning to this table on this beautiful Sabbath and remember Remember that He has died on the cross for you and me. God bless you.